Well, good morning, Bramley Alliance Church family, and welcome to the start of the Easter week. Yes, today we are kicking off New Beginnings in just a little bit, and it is going to be an exciting time. On Friday, this coming week, we have our Good Friday services, and they will be at the regular times, 9 a.m. and 1045. And during the second service, we have a kids program for those who are toddlers. I urge you, uh, come on out, invite friends. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, next Sunday, come on out. It's going to be amazing. And, and you might be wondering, hey, Scott, where are you this week? Well, Julie's away. So I'm coming to you from her office, and one never knows what you might find in Julie's office. <laughs> it's going to be a pretty fun office in here. Anyway, a uh, couple other things that I need to make you aware of. Uh, summer uh, staff positions are now available. Uh, if you'd like to uh, apply for those, uh, they, we are looking for three positions for community service workers and two positions for audio visual technicians. So if you'd like to apply for those, get those uh, applications in. The deadline to apply is April 30. So please uh, take some time if you're interested in those. Now tonight, very important, we have a praise gathering tonight. So I wanna encourage you to come on out to the praise night. It's gonna be awesome and it will be starting at 6.30 in the welcome hall. Now, women of joy. They are a great group. 50 plus, uh, you have an event on Tuesday at 9.30. And ladies, if you're coming to that, please bring your glue guns with you. It'll be a fun time for you as you come together. I think this is like the first time in a while that you've gotten together. So you want to be there. You don't want to miss it. So I mentioned last Sunday that we are looking for quizzing coaches. And we still are. But on April 24th at 9 a.m., uh, that's the first service, there will be a quizzing open house. So if you're a student, grade seven, or going into grade seven, up to grade 12, and you wanted to check out what is quizzing all about, well, come on down uh, and check out what happens in quizzing. Uh, it'll be in the chat room at 9 a.m. on April 24th. So parents, you are more than welcome to come to find out what that's all about. And if you're interested in being a coach, that's where you want to be on April 24th. So tomorrow night, April the 11th at 7 p.m., if you are a parent of a graduating grade 12 student, you're going to want to be here at the church at 7 o'clock in the chat room because we are going to be planning this year's grad banquet. Yes, this is the first time in over two years we've actually been able to have an in-person grad banquet with a wonderful, incredible meal of celebrating with our grade 12 students this important rite of passage. And we have a long history now of doing this. In the last two years, we've had to get really creative about how that happened. This year, we're coming back to an awesome banquet. So parents, we need you to come on out because you're the one that makes this all happen. Uh, alongside some of us on staff, and we want to see you there tomorrow night, uh, April 11th, 7 p.m., in the chat room for the grad parents meeting for the grad banquet, June 11th. Now, there is something else happening over the course of the Easter weekend. It's a busy weekend, lots of great stuff happening, but there's also a men's breakfast that will be going on at 8.30 Saturday morning here at the church. We will be in the welcome hall, and it's always an amazing meal, but this time we don't just have one speaker, we have three, Larry Heen, Peter Graham, and myself. We're gonna be doing a panel on accountability and how important that is, uh, that we need each other to do life together. Kind of like what uh, Ian Trey was talking about last week, better together. Guys, we are better together. So come on out and join us for breakfast over the course of the Easter weekend. Well, that's all for me today from Julie's office. Kenny, what are you doing here? Hey, Scott, can I help with this? Uh, I'm sorry, buddy, we're all done. But we do miss you, Julie. Hopefully see you back here in a, another week or so. And my friends, we are about now to enter into worship and it is going to be an awesome Sunday that we can all be together. Thank you for joining us today. As Pastor Scott and friends said, thank you for joining us today and good morning church. We are so glad that you're here with us today, whether you're here in person or joining us online. Come, let us join together to welcome the coming King and prepare our hearts for Easter week. 
We will journey through praise with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow, for he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We wave palm branches in anticipation. We lay our love before him to cushion his walk. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who brings us the kingdom of God. So the painting for Palm Sunday, um, I wanted to imagine what it would be like if Jesus came to Brampton instead of Jerusalem. So I set it downtown at Four Corners in Brampton. And what would we do if we thought our Messiah had come? We'd probably have a parade. So everyone's excited. They're thinking, Jesus has come. He's come. Our day is here. Look at it. It's wonderful. And what would we do? We would take pictures with our phones and be really excited. Um, but you can see it's sunset. It's evening. The clock says six o'clock. Uh, they don't really know it yet, but the sun is setting on their earthly hopes. So they'll have to wait and see if their Messiah really has come for them or not. Please stand if you're able to join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior.
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. because it is because of you. It's because you went to the triumphal entry. It's because you went to the cross that we can have life. So let's, with the people of Israel this morning, praise God and give him the glory for all that he has done. Oh 
You can go ahead and have a seat. And I am going to read the scripture uh, that is going to be part of Joe's sermon. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to John chapter 12. If you uh, like to use your online app, you can uh, open up your app and turn to uh, John chapter 12. And we're going to be reading verses 9 through 36. So John chapter 12, verses 9 to 36. When the crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel! And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. And I, so now's the judgment, sorry, now's the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard that from the law, the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, Believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Hey, do you see this? Look around you. Check this out. Now, oh, by the way, my name is Thomas Didymus. I'm one of Jesus' disciples. Here's Jesus making his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He's finally getting this significant recognition he deserves here. People are rallying around from him and his mission. So it appears anyways. 
Look at all these people. People from all over who have heard or seen the incredible things he has done. In three short years, he's been so many things. But what happened with Lazarus is what's really captivating everyone's attention and exciting them. This is becoming huge. Do you know what happened with Lazarus? Oh, okay, well, you haven't heard? Okay, let me tell you so now you can understand what prompted this crowd. Uh, Jesus was friends with Lazarus and his sisters who lived in Bethany. Despite receiving a message that Lazarus was very sick, uh, Jesus insisted we stay put where we were at the time. I mean, Jesus already knew the specifics of what was happening with Lazarus. The father already told him, but we didn't have a clue. After a couple of days, he said, let's go back to Judea to see Lazarus. Now, this, uh, it set off a huge reaction because it had only been a few days previous when people in Judea were trying to stone Jesus. We couldn't believe he would risk his safety. Now, my companions had tried to persuade Jesus not to go. Jesus said Lazarus had fallen asleep and we needed to go wake him. We all thought that was great news because it meant he must be on the mend. Eventually, he came out and straight out and told us that Lazarus was dead. Even more, God was going to use this event to bring glory and attention to himself. And through it, we would believe even more in Jesus. It sounded good to me, so at that point, I piped in, let's go too and die with Jesus. I got a few looks from that comment. I didn't think some of them knew how to take me and the others were not amused in any case. They might have been wrestling with their own personal fears of safety, in addition to concerns for Jesus' welfare. Regardless, we went, and Jesus summoned Lazarus to come out from the tomb after he's been decaying for three days. I never forget standing in front of the tomb and Jesus asking for the stone to be moved then calling out to Lazarus for him to come forth. I'll admit, I may have had some doubts. I mean, what if he didn't come out? We all stood there, holding our breath, waiting, and Lazarus walked out. We still had this, he still had his burial wax on, and he didn't smell at all. It was like he truly had been asleep. Everybody was left in total amazement. I mean, how is this possible? Who is this Jesus? And word spread like wildfire. Now, <laughs> the religious leaders who came to witness Jesus' failure, they were speechless. So here we are. Momentum has certainly turned, hasn't it? This new kingdom that Jesus had been preaching was starting to seem more tangible. We had arrived. Our patience is starting to pay off. What Jesus taught us about God and his plans for us about becoming to, is becoming a national reality. Jesus is the chosen one of Israel. There was this now, this tremendous momentum. People were seriously thinking, is Jesus the expected Messiah? Our king? He had orchestrated this procession sending two disciples to borrow a young, unridden donkey from a nearby town. I believe King Solomon also rode a donkey on the day of his coronation as king. Why a donkey? Well, donkeys were symbols of peace, and often kings would ride on them when they would enact treaties. So, uh, well, Jesus wanted a donkey, so we got him a donkey. Branches and clothes and other articles of honor were being tossed in front of Jesus, just like paving a way for a king. He had calmed storms, cast out demons. He healed countless sicknesses and diseases. He pulled a coin out of a fish's mouth, and he raised people from the dead. He displayed signs and wonders declaring the power of God. 
Now people were proclaiming him as king. Can you hear him? Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. This is incredible. Zechariah's words are coming to pass. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So many great things are before us. We're in the middle of a hugely historic moment. Our freedom and his revelation of kingship to Israel and all of us. This is just the beginning. Good morning, church family. It's my privilege to begin our Easter sermon series, and uh, you may, when you've come in, you may have gotten these sermon notes. These are not for uh, you to think that I have anything brilliant to say. This is so that you can follow me in my meanderings, and we'll go on this path together. And then on the back, you'll see that there's a place if you wanted to jot some thoughts down, some questions for reflection as you prepare your hearts for Easter. So let's uh, come to the Lord in prayer, ask him to bless our time of teaching. Dear God, this morning we come before your word, understanding that you have given it to us as a gift. It helps us put on spectacles to see our world more clearly. It helps us to understand your heart more fully. It brings us more into love relationship with you. So would you use it this morning to transform us? to help us weigh out our perspectives and to encourage us and give us hope for the future. Would you use your word to bring fruit into our lives? And we pray this in your name. Amen. So our three-part sermon series that we're doing this year has been entitled New Beginnings. And we all recognize that we each go through seasons of life that end and then launch us into new life, into new beginnings. And sometimes the season that we're in is so good, we never want it to end. And at other times, we're like, man, I can't wait. I can't wait for this to be over. We are in suffering or it's draining us and we just want to escape into something new. And I love how this historical account of Easter paints all of these complexities for us in the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so this Palm Sunday, we're going to look at how the ending of an era requires a new beginning. And our passage this morning is filled with people looking at their current circumstances, imagining what the future holds. And the challenge for them is, as it is with us, it's all about perspective. It's all about how are we going to look at the future? Do we move into the future with expectations or anticipation? And I found this uh, really good quote defining these two words, the differences between them that's in your sermon notes uh, to help us consider navigating from the ending of an era into a new reality. And this is the quote, expectation is projecting an imagined reality onto the future. Anticipation is looking forward with excitement to what is coming, resting the assurance that it will be good regardless of what form it takes. And that's a lot of words, so I, I tried to uh, make it more succinct with uh, an alliteration to capture some of this. So the first is this. This is the first one. Expectations poison possibilities through the projection of preferences. Expectations poison possibilities through the projection of preferences. This is what I want, and therefore, this is what needs to happen. And anything different from that is unacceptable. Anticipation actively awaits an affirmative adventure. 
So in anticipation, I believe that the future has positivity. It's an adventure I'm going to go on, and I'm actively waiting for all the good things that are going to come my way. <laughs> when we look into our future we, and, and we project our preferences, we not only desire others to conform into our plan, but we expect God to as well. And when things don't look or feel in our future as they should, we begin to have bitterness in our relationships. We begin to project blame onto others. My future doesn't look like I want it to because you did this or you didn't do that. Or God, you didn't show up for me. But if we look into the future anticipating a positive path, believing that we can learn and flex in order to make the best of what comes our way, we have a different perspective that actually looks for the good. We're actually looking for what God is going to be doing. And for those who don't believe in God, they call upon good karma to make this happen for them, or they believe in lady luck, good fortune in this temporary world. But for the believer, for the follower of Jesus, we can anticipate a positive future that is guaranteed in eternity, no matter what the temporary world holds. So in our passage this morning, we have several groups of people who are looking to the future with expectation. We heard from Thomas, and we'll explore that in a bit. And what we don't see directly in our passage is Rome, the Romans, but they are a presence that are constantly being felt throughout the Easter story. Jerusalem had originally been conquered and ruled over by Babylon, the Persians, the Hellenistic Greeks. And then when Rome sought to expand their authority throughout, throughout Asia, it came to 63 BC and Pompey the Great captured Jerusalem on behalf of Rome. And so Rome entered in and became the ruler of the known world, bringing taxes, peace, armies. They dispersed people throughout their empire. They demanded submission. There's only one God, and that's Caesar. And for Rome, they, they seemed invincible. They couldn't perceive an outside force growing strong enough to overthrow their rule. They expected to remain the world power. They never anticipated for a moment the enemy within that ended up being their demise. Maybe, maybe for some of us, we experience that same thing. Our, our future is bright. We like where we're at. We love our job. Everything is stable. We cannot foresee that anything would change. Well, the Jewish people, after hundreds of years of subjugation, they had a very different perspective than Rome. <laughs> they were praying for a savior. They were praying for a Messiah to come who would rescue them, who, who would rise up like a king who would not only reestablish the glory of the days of King Solomon, but launch them into a never-ending kingdom that would make them a world power and envy of the world. Here's a, a brief recap about what the days of Solomon looked like. They would have used this, they would have latched upon this to form what they believed would be their future. Forming their expectations. In 1 Kings chapter 4, we read this. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety. Everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. Now, doesn't that sound amazing? You go, know, well, I, I'm good with the vine. I'm not so big on figs, but whatever floats your boat. What, what, what this passage is actually saying is that everyone had their own home. You think about where we're at now with society, the, the cost of inflation rising, the cost of housing. It would be nice if everyone could own their own home, right? And, and live in safety without fear of someone taking it away. That was King Solomon's day. It gets better. First King chapters chapter 10 the weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents. Now, 
my personality type can't leave that alone because I'm like, I don't even know what a talent is, so I have to, I have to look that up. And so 666 talents is the equivalent of 23 metric tons of gold every year that he would have. This, this is not, just so you know, this is just gold that came in, that just came in. And so I hopped on Google, because Google tells us everything. And I found out that in the last two weeks, gold was 62 million US dollars per ton. And so when I punched that in my little calculator, this is what I came up with. That Solomon was receiving yearly 1.43 billion US dollars in gold every year. Or 1.8 billion Canadian dollars every year. Just in gold. That didn't include, that, that wasn't like through taxation. That wasn't through anything else. That was just gold that happened to be coming in. And we're told that this wasn't including the revenues from merchants or in traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of the territories. It gets even better. Listen to this. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the, all the other kings of the earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom of God that he had put on his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons and spices, and horses and mules. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. As stones. That means, gentlemen, if you were to be in that era and you brought your wife something silver for her birthday, no, no, sir. You just brought me dirt. That's crazy to me. They wanted what had been to be their future of what would be. Have you ever felt the way, looked back in your life, and you went, man, I had it, I had it so good back then. That, that was the best. That, that was, that, man, I, I reached, I peaked early. I want to go back there. That's what I want. And, and that's what the Jewish people were looking for, but they wanted even more. And, and Jesus upped the ante of what was expected. I mean, they wanted, they wanted glory and power and respect. They wanted wealth. They wanted dominion. They wanted it forever. And then Jesus comes along, and they're like, how could King Solomon get any better? Well, I'll tell you. You know what Solomon didn't do? He never caused the blind to see. He, he never caused the lame to walk. Jesus was able to feed multitudes with a few bread and a few fish. S Solomon had no control over the supernatural world. And he certainly did not raise someone from the dead like Jesus did with Lazarus. I imagine for a moment a king that could do all that. Your nation would never be in need. Everyone would always be fed. There would be no sickness in the land. You'd have an invincible army, and any of the army that passed away through war, the king could come and raise them back to life. Is it, is it any wonder that they wanted Jesus to be king? I mean, who could compare? Expectations of a preferred future. The religious leaders, they had expectations too. I mean, after Rome was kicked out, they, they believed that they would be rewarded and should be rewarded for the gracious leadership that they had provided for all those hundreds of years under the rule of other nations. I mean, they served the people. They deserved a place at the table. And then this Jesus comes along with all of his trickery and he doesn't respect us and give us our due. And so what they wanted is they thought our preferred future, the way that we get to the table, the way that we get respect, the way that we get what we, we deserve, Jesus needs to die. We're going to take that wannabe Messiah, have him killed with his proof of purchase like Lazarus, who says this guy is legit. We're going to get him rid of both of them. Then... When the real Messiah comes, then we'll have our future that we deserve and want. I don't know if you're allowed to say this in church, but have you ever thought in your, in your life, 
man, if that person wasn't in my life anymore, <laughs> my life would be cherry. Uh, that person's like a pebble in my shoe. And, and if that person was gone, man, it would be sweet. No, no one's going to, I'm not going to ask for the raising of hands to see if that's been something you've thought. But I think we all have experienced those moments where we love that person farther away. Then we come to the disciples, and the disciples, they had expectations as well about what the future would hold. I mean, think about it. How could they not? They had just spent three years with Jesus, living with him, sleeping on the road, uh, serving beside him, hearing him preach, and then watching with power as he proved the message of the kingdom. They saw all of these miracles that could only have come from God in heaven above. Jesus had the power of heaven answering his requests. They had been moved from a bunch of ragtag nobodies to being known as those who spent time with the rabbi. They were his right-hand people. They were his group. And after three long years of serving, they were finally coming into that sweet spot. People were finally seeing Jesus as the rightful king he was. Crowds had followed Jesus in the past, but now they were exalting and lifting him high. They were actually proclaiming him as king. Before, the crowds always wanted something from Jesus, but this crowd was giving Jesus honor and praise. They are finally exalting him. The future looked bright it was filled with even better days to come. And there are these groups with their expectations. And then in the midst of all of that, there's Jesus. He saw the future differently. And when everyone else was consumed with expectations about the present or the near distant future, he anticipated a better future to come that was a whole other dimension. It was beyond their imagination, it was incomparable and inconceivable to those around him. And Jesus was able to put the temporary in its proper place, even when he knew there was going to be pain and death in his immediate future. And I think about our passage today, I think we can learn a lot from Jesus about perspective regarding the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. And so for the rest of our time together, I would like us to reflect upon the four discomforts of the end of an era and then close by finding hope with anticipation in the four comforts about the end of an era and specifically how our faith enables us to face that ending of one era while looking forward to the next. You see, recognizing the challenges of, an, of the ending of an era can help us navigate into the new. And, and it, it, it acknowledges the challenges of change. It honors our story. It gives voice to the pain of our current experience. It grounds us when we are riding the high of success. And so, uh, the high of success. Let's just look at this and take a moment to ponder together the discomfort about the end of an era. The first discomfort is that it brings death. The crowd was with them. Jesus had pulled off this incredible miracle in front of friends and families, the authorities, the crowd. There was no doubt that Lazarus had indeed been dead. And there was no doubt that he was now raised to life. It's inarguable. People were going out and testifying about this on their own free will their own inclination and enthusiasm. Word was spreading beyond imagination, and this movement of Jesus was gaining unprecedented, explosive momentum. But there's Jesus. You'd think he'd be riding the high of this, but instead he begins to talk about how a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies in order for a transition into a new age to begin. 
And as much as we don't want to acknowledge it, it's a fact. Any change requires the death of the previous reality in order to enter into the new. It's fact. It's a fact. And sometimes this change is sudden and immediate, like when a tragedy occurs and we lose a loved one or we receive our our pink slip at work. We come in with our coffee and suddenly we find ourselves immediately unemployed. Maybe it's the crash of the market. We see our dreams for retirement go up in smoke. Or we receive news that our, our health is now in imminent danger. We may not live for very long in this world. Perhaps we've been given some warning, so it's not immediate. It's coming, and we go, okay, it's coming. It might be tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, but change is coming. And that's fine to have a transition, but what ends up happening is we immediately enter into a stage of grieving because something is passing away. Change is forced upon us. And sure, it will be here eventually, but the truth is, we are going to be leaving one age and entering into another. Even when we are in a position of difficulty, sometimes the devil that we know is more comfortable than the unknown future in front. And so in order for a new age to begin, an era needs to end. When that era ends, the second discomfort is that it brings risk. We're entering to the unknown. The very foundations of what we once relied upon may or may not continue into the future. The knowledge that we thought was solid and sure may no longer apply. If we look at verse 25, Jesus says this, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoa, Jesus, are you saying that in order for me to have eternal life, I need to let go of my life here? That I need to let go of control? That the tighter I hold on to my temporary life in this world, the more difficult it is to grasp eternity. And that's what Jesus is saying. And we see that. Jesus himself is experiencing this conundrum. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. Now is my soul troubled. Jesus didn't remain untouched. This isn't a rhetorical statement. He's saying... Now, my soul is in a place of internal conflict. My soul is troubled. And he says, but, but what am I going to do? Am I, am I going to say to the Father, save me from this? Remove this from me? Jesus understands that there's this external view about, uh, of what is about to happen. He is going to face immediate pain and death. And from from all optics, it looks like he's risking everything that has been done before. It looks like he's gambling it away. He's giving up his life in order to bring a harvest of life for others. And with that comes pain and hurt. And it's going to hurt big time. It's going to hurt so much it kills him. That's the third discomfort of the end of an era, is that it brings varying degrees of discomfort and suffering. Even when we move into what we perceive to be a better future, there are things that are new, and there's some discomfort as we acclimatize to our new reality. And for most of us, change brings an amount of suffering and pain, because usually it means rough waters ahead. We've never charted a course here before. For us to ignore this reality is to either turn a blind eye in an attempt to live in naivety 
or it's an attempt to acknowledge that we aren't in pain. It's, if we don't acknowledge it, we won't feel inadequate for the future. If we don't acknowledge it, we won't show that we are unprepared. If we don't acknowledge it, we won't appear weak. We won't feel weak if we just don't acknowledge it. But the elephant in the room isn't going anywhere. Everyone knows there's an elephant in the room. And just because you turn your eyes away from the emperor's new clothes doesn't mean that that erases that reality. It's right in front of us. It is what is truth. And when we look at Jesus, he doesn't look to increase his anxiety through ignoring the reality. Instead, he acknowledges it. His death is going to usher in a new age of life, and it appears that all sacrifice that will be made, all gains will be lost at personal cost to himself. Him suffering is not going to cost the disciples anything. A little discomfort, but, but he is going to bear the cost. It's not going to cost the religious leaders anything except maybe some money to throw a party. Jesus is going to take it all on. At a time where he should be basking in popularity, he instead tells the crowd that he'll be lifted up from the earth in a death that will extinguish his light among everyone, putting the perceived future of the kingdom in danger. The end of an era. The end of Jesus on earth. And, and with that, it means people were confronted about what does the future look like. If one era ends, we are forced to look at the future. Even when things are at their best, even when we think that we're going to leave one era and move into something better, we are forced to look into the future of what could be. <laughs> it could be really positive, but, but work with me on this for a moment. Imagine you had a windfall of financial luck. Suddenly you had more money than ever before. You go, this is great. What a wonderful future. And then you sit down and you start thinking, well, now with this influx of money coming in, does that mean I'm in a different income tax bracket? Am I going to see the gains that I've made or is the government going to take that from me? Oh, what should I invest in? What investments are sure? How do I secure this so I don't lose my gain? Should I be taking holidays? Where should I go? How much should I spend? How much should I bank? How much should I save? What should I buy? Then you have your spouse enter into the conversation, and then it's a real party. Or how about this? You're finally for the, your wedding day is coming, and you're finally going to spend the rest of your life with the love of your life. And it's amazing. And then you go, I wonder what side of the bed I'm going to sleep on. Who's going to control the covers? What if they snore? What do I do with my laundry when something isn't dirty enough to launder but is not clean enough to put in with the brand clean? What do I do with that? In fact, who's going to do the laundry? And then you're like, and then speaking of that, who's going to cook dinner? And in order for us to cook dinner, who's going to go buy the groceries? I'm busy. That person's busy. Who's going to do? And then you start spiraling down into what was you first initially thought, this future looks bright. And then you're starting to take on all the practical uh, repercussions of this change in life. And you're like, man, there's a lot of details here. Then there's the other side. What if we need to downsize? And we find ourselves standing in a room surrounded by personal belongings that we have loved that hold meaning to us, but now we have to purge it. What do we get rid of? How do we move from this to this? Maybe we find ourselves no longer with a partner in life. And things are going to look very different from here on out. From doing taxes to finances to holidays to family, life will never be the same. Or you've lost a loved one. And you're thinking to yourself, how can I face the future without them? How do I move forward when I carry a broken heart? You see, our reality is that there's no pause button on the future. 
Because we know that the next second, the next minute, the next week, the next month is right before us. The transformation from present into the future occurs with every single breath we take. And that won't change the reality that the future is constantly knocking on our door in every moment. And each of us faces the, the future very uniquely to our own person. How we process mentally, spiritually, emotionally, uh, physically, it's like a fingerprint that's unique to us and our personality type. And so we, we find ourselves at a fork in the road when we start considering the future. We can either face the end of an era with expectations about how our future in the world should look, or we can look with anticipation and in faith to watch and see how our future could look when we trust in God and see beyond the here and now. We can look to Jesus to see how he handled the end of an era and place our faith in him as he's the one that ushers in the new future of hope for us. So let's do that. Let's kind of close our time off. We're going to look at the comfort about the end of an era. And, and so the first is this. New beginnings can bring something bigger and better than we ever imagined or ever have experienced. Look with me in verse 20 and following. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, That's great. Show the men. Put on the coffee. No, that's not what he said. He said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. And in this moment, we see Jesus knowing that the time has come for the harvest to go beyond the nation of Israel into the world. And the disciples, probably along with the crowd, they most likely believed that Jesus would be like King Solomon. He would be a magnet to the world, and the world would find themselves coming to Jesus. They never would have imagined that Jesus was the good shepherd that actually would be going out to seek and save the lost. Jesus, the word of life, that would spread like wildfire as his followers went throughout the known world, bringing the good news of the gospel with them. Jesus, that seed of grain that falls on the ground and dies and transfers his DNA to all of his believers who then go and as they love and serve the world, as they go out and they serve and love and die, they too create a harvest and transfer Jesus' DNA to those people. And the multiplication just goes on and on and on, bigger, bigger than even be conceived. I mean, when, when God met with Abraham and came up with this covenant of faith with Abraham, he said, your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore like the stars in the sky. It was bigger than Israel. This harvest would grow in momentum and numbers as the followers of Jesus became Christians. And I love the descriptive word Christian. The original Greek for the word Christian is Christianos, which comes from two Greek words, Christ and Tien. And the word Christ means anointed, and Tian means little. And so the word Christian little, real, literally means little anointed ones. You're a little anointed one. That's what you are. I'm a little anointed one. It, it means that we're appointed as anointed ambassadors to go throughout the world. We carry the DNA of Christ as part of something bigger than ourselves, bigger than we could have imagined. And in, and in this amazing future, we have the comfort that this. New beginnings offer us opportunity for a deeper life with Christ. You see, if we think about going into the future bigger than we ever imagined as ambassadors, and we think, well, this is a very, very big uh, uh, discussion we need to have. This is a very big mission that you've put me on. And we, we 
start to contemplate doing it on our own in our own strength, it's very stressful. It's very overwhelming. We feel inadequate. Um, But if you look at verse 25 and following, this is what Jesus says. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. So first is this. We can risk our lives with love in this world for the gospel because we have eternal life. There's a security in eternity that can ground us in the here and now and to love so much more deeply than the world can even imagine because we can let go. We know that we're loved. We know that we're secure. The second part of this, I'll, I'll just, it's a very simple equation. Um, who lives for eternity? God. I know, it's, it was a trick question. Who lives for eternity? God. Therefore, if we have eternal life, whose life do we have? God's. We have the eternal life of God in us. Which is why when Paul writes, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in you, we can move with confidence and a surety. Not timidity. Not to be jerks and be like, oh, look at me, check me out. Nothing like that. But we can go and we can, it means we can risk and love. And we can sacrifice for other people. It's okay. We're going to be okay. That's what Jesus did. And so here's the great thing is it's not just about Jesus in us. It's not just about God's life in us, but Jesus moves with us. That's what he says in this passage, that when we serve Jesus, we follow him. We go where he goes. We do what he does. We speak what he would speak. And Jesus moves through us. And when we look at the future, we do so with Jesus. And we have opportunities to rely on him, trust in him, walk with him deeper than ever before into a new reality. It means that we leave one era and enter into a new where God has done and is doing new things in us and through us and will do new things in us and through us. Which means, point three, we can take comfort in new beginnings because it allows God to be glorified more than ever before. Jesus is about to glorify God not by ascending to a throne of worldly power, but by hanging on a cross to provide spiritual victory. Uh, The scene is now set for the grace of God, the love of God, to be seen as never before. God is going to pay the price for sin on our behalf through his death. Jesus will draw all people to himself not because he was a spectacle on, a, on the splendor of a gold throne in a gold throne room. No. But because he would provide the cure for the greatest historical global pandemic that has plagued humanity from creation to the cross. That is sin and death. And Satan, the ruler who feeds on fear, sin, and death, the one who torments and seeks to enslave and damn humanity, would experience the draining of his power along with the complete and total defeat. Our comfort as we move to the new beginnings is that God would be glorified more than ever in our lives because we're free. What power on earth, what power in the spiritual realm can come against us? We're free. God can be glorified more than ever before in our lives. We look forward with hope and anticipation because with our faith, we believe God will move. God will do bigger things. Off script here, BAC family If you think your glory days are in the past, you'll miss what God has for the future. God has great things in store. He has amazing things in store. 
He has powerful things in store. We need to believe that. We need to live that out. We need to live in faith that God will move more than he ever has. We can do this because Jesus offered to us and brings us permanent positive change. And that's our fourth and final point. Let's look at verse 35 in closing. So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons and daughters of light. And Jesus is talking to them about how he is the light of the world who enables people to find their path to God. And when one is in darkness, we travel by feel. (laughs) My wife and I, we had a cat named Bella who was black. If you ever want to know what it's like to walk in darkness, try walking through a house in blackness with a black cat. We don't know what's going to support us, help us, hinder us, harm us. We don't, in darkness, you don't know. You literally, you don't even know what direction you're going. I remember I had the opportunity to go into the, the catacombs in Rome in Italy where the Christians would hide. And we were into this carved stone underneath the city. And our tour guide, who ironically was from New York City, um, said, okay, everyone, we want you to extinguish your lights. Please don't go off the path, because if you do, we'll never find you again. And we're like, okay. And then we shut off our lights, and I have never been in such utter darkness. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And that's what Jesus is saying here. The one who travels in darkness, you don't even know where you're going. You are literally completely lost. But don't fear. I am the light. And when we have the light, we enter into faith, and there's this transformation that takes place. We no longer just experience the light, but we actually become sons and daughters of light. We become the light of the world. We carry the DNA of Jesus wherever we go. And that's what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and following, when he says, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. Brief aside, notice who qualifies us. You don't. You can't. It's God who qualifies us. And he qualifies us to share in the inheritance of the saints of the light. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have the redemption and the forgiveness of sins. You see, there's this permanent positive change in our position with God from being his enemy trapped in a kingdom of darkness to becoming his children as citizens, little anointed Christ in the kingdom of light. We are now the lights of the world. We are lights that have hope to shine among others. We are are the lights that offer to them the one who can transform their future and offer them positive, permanent change. And perhaps when you look at the future, there's this fog of the unknown that causes you concern, and and that is valid. That is a valid perspective. It can also mean, though, that what we can't see is that there's something in the future for us that's better than ever before. We will experience change. That's inevitable. And we will be changed. All of us can admit that we are not the same person today as we were two months, two years ago. We've all been changed. But God can continue to shape us and form us into the future to look more and more like Jesus. That is his desire for us to look more and more like Jesus. And so for those of us who are the children of light in the kingdom of light, our future is bright, regardless of what we're currently encountering in the temporary world. We are a people of new beginnings, and we can offer that hope to everyone around us. We can be the people who actively anticipate God leading us in a positive adventure that will eventually bring us to his side in heaven. 
the ending of, the, of an era automatically brings us new beginnings. And so may God be glorified more than ever before in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our world. In the name of Jesus, let's pray. Dear God, as we come before you, we acknowledge that we all go through seasons of change and it can be really difficult. And when people don't acknowledge the difficulty, it can cause us to feel shame or inadequate. It can help. It can cause us to feel alone. But we see you going through change in this passage. We see you going through hardship and suffering. And you do it with hope because you know the future is better and brighter and bigger and greater than ever before. And your kingdom was, is established. And you bring us in as family. And so, God, I pray this morning that we would continue to come with anticipation of an affirmative adventure walking with you in a deeper life, and seeing you move as never before. In the name of Jesus, our King, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together, and we're going to close with a song that we've uh, been singing for a little while uh, here, Faithful Now. And, uh, and the fact that we can stand on God's word, and that even uh, as we anticipate some of the new beginnings that Joe was talking about, that our God is faithful and that uh, he was faithful then and he is also faithful now and he will continue to be faithful. So let's sing that together. Bye.
Did you know that your Savior with wounded feet walks along the path of life with you? May his wounded heart fill yours with love and mercy and compassion and grace for other people that are, are struggling and going through change and having a hard time. May he, his wounded hands move yours to serve and bring help and healing. As you serve them, would you do so as if you're serving Jesus himself? Because you are. And may they see the face of Christ in you. May they see you as the little anointed one. You are loved. And so go love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be blessed. Have a great week.